Hey Hope, it's Rachel and Dan, and we're here to highlight a way that our new website will be helpful for you, whether you're new at Hope or you've been around for a while. So check out HopeChurchRVA.com. If you hover up top, you'll notice a tab that says Next Steps. There you'll find information on upcoming events, you'll find ways to connect with our family ministries, and find ways that you can join other connection opportunities such as joining a group, class, or find other ways to serve. And beside the Next Steps tab, you'll see resources where you can watch or listen to past sermons, check out Hope Music and listen to some original songs our worship team has created, or check out more resources like sermon discussion guides, links to things our pastors mention in sermons, and so much more. So check it out. Thanks for being with us today. Let's worship.
let's pray. Father, we do not have much, but all we have is a gift from you. Lord, we thank you for entrusting us um, with this world that you've created for us. Um, and we thank you for the hearts that you've put in us. Um, Lord, by your spirit, would we grow to be more like you? In the name of your son, Jesus, amen. Hey everybody, you know, the journey of leading Hope Church over these years has been so incredible. There have been some really high times of incredible celebrating. There've also been some very low times that were incredibly challenging. I remember about 20 years ago when Hope was in a very, very difficult financial season. Personally, I didn't have two nickels to rub together either, so it felt like the shortages of money were putting pressure everywhere in my life. I happened to be walking downtown and a woman came up to me on the street and she looked at me, this very small, petite woman who looked like life had been very difficult. And she looked at me and she said, sir, can you help me? So I had this moment because I knew that I only had a $20 bill in my pocket. I didn't have any money to myself at the moment. And I thought, if I'm gonna help this woman, I'm gonna have to give her 20 bucks. So I said to her, can you tell me your name? And she told me your name and we talked for a moment. And while we were talking, my phone rang. So I said to her, could you please excuse me for just a moment? I answered my phone and the person on the other end of the phone is someone who lives out of state, who knows about Hope. You'd call them a friend of Hope. And this person said to me, David, I've heard that Hope is in a really difficult financial time right now. Is that true? And I said, yes. And this person said, well, I'd really like to try to help if I can. So now I'm conflicted because I think I have to talk to this person, but I can't disrespect this woman in front of me. So I asked the person on the phone, could I call you back? And they said, yes. So I came back to talk to this woman. I gave her the $20 bill. I felt like I had to pry it out of my pocket, maybe pry it out of my heart, given the circumstances of the moment. She looked at me and she began to cry. And she said to me, thank you so much. It was near Thanksgiving time. She said, now I can buy a Thanksgiving meal for my family. She's crying and she looked at me and she said to me, could I touch you? Are you an angel? And I said to her, you can touch me. I can promise you I'm not an angel. This incredible moment and it all converged that here was this woman asking me for money and then I'm on the phone with somebody and I'm the one asking for money. Later in the day, I talked to this other person and the next couple of days, they made a sizable six figure contribution to Hope that helped us through a really crucible season. The whole experience of all those convergences coming together in one moment is a time I'll never forget. So that story and many other experiences that are similar to it, both in the journey of Hope Church and in my own life personally, have taught me so much. I feel like God has spoken into my heart about this matter of generosity so here's how I've come to understand this idea of generosity. I think it is intimately connected to gratitude. And gratitude is my response to all that God has done for me. If I really understand all that God has done for me, if I really appreciate it, then the obvious result is this deep gratitude to Him. And the result of gratitude then is generosity. So when I'm doing my own spiritual diagnostics and asking myself about generosity, I'm asking myself, well, am I really grateful to God for all that he's given me and for all that he's done for me? And then generosity is an overflow of gratitude. Throughout the Bible, we see what a generous God we have. He gave us his son, his only son. He gave us life. The Lord gave Adam and Eve charge over caring for the Garden of Eden. And since then, He has given us charge of stewarding all that He's given us, our time, our talent, and our treasures. We're to be generous with it. And it's a get to with God. It's a partnership that we have the opportunity to do things and give of what He's given us to further the kingdom. It's the opportunity to go into missions, the opportunity to support missions. It's the opportunity to see churches planted. We get to come alongside others and help them 
we get to share the gospel in new and creative ways. And as we're doing this, our hearts are changed. We become closer to God. We're able to trust Him with all He's entrusted with us. When we share our time, talent, treasure, and we do it with the heart of God, the action becomes transformational in our hearts. It's no longer transactional. We go from transactional to transformational, and we are transformed. So the Bible tells us that God is both joyful and He's generous. I don't think that's a coincidence. I heard years ago a quote that said, I've never met a generous person who was unhappy. I love that thought of how these things are all woven together from the heart of a God who is joyful and generous. So as Melinda said, these opportunities to grow in generosity are about the transformations that happen in our own hearts. God is setting us free and he's inviting us into partnership with him to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to the whole world. I mean, think of it for a moment. God is saying, let's do this together. I am more convinced than ever the world needs this gospel of Jesus, this love, this identity affirmation, this forgiveness and the heart change. That happens when the gospel of Jesus Christ, when Christ himself becomes real in our lives, we want to be a church that helps that opportunity be available to as many people as possible. So I'm inviting you to pray about this idea of generosity and your own giving. Ask God to move in your life and teach you at the heart level. And then let's be a community, a church that is characterized by this incredible joy and this great generosity. Would you join me for another moment of prayer? Gracious and loving God, we give you our praise and our worship because of who you are. God, you are kind, you are wise, you're strong, and you're generous. Lord, thank you for the many ways in which you give of yourself so freely to us. God, we receive your hope through the promises of your word. You give us such riches out of your grace and your mercy. And Lord, you demonstrate your love for us by giving us your only son, Jesus. God, it's my prayer that we would continue to see your love and generosity at work in us. And God, as we witness your mighty hand of provision working on our behalf, Lord, would we be then spurred to be kind and to be generous to the world around us. And Lord, would all of this be to your glory. Lord, we worship you today. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Dan. I'm part of the team here at Hope, and it's great to have you with us. Whether you are online or on-site, it's great to worship together today. The video that you just saw will be teeing up today's message pretty well. Um, we are in a current series called If Then. In other words, if the resurrection is true, then fill in the blank. And today, in a few moments, our senior pastor, David Dwight, will share a message on if the resurrection is true, then we can live and give generously. So I'm excited to hear from him, and we hope that you are as well. At this point, we want to give you the opportunity to continue in your worship through your giving and through your generosity. So up on your screen, you'll find some information where you can give to hope using our convenient text to give function, or if you wanna give directly on our website, you'll see that there on your screen. Again, we wanna thank you for your generosity and through your partnership so that we can indeed help others find life and purpose in Jesus Christ. So again, thank you so much for being here with us today. It's great to worship together. Good morning, everybody. Great to see you. So glad to have you here in person. 
And if you're joining us on live stream, it's great to be together. Thanks for joining us. So Easter was three weeks ago. And to try to enter into what we're hoping might be the effect of this series, you have to enter into that. So I want you to imagine for a moment that you are one of the disciples from the pages of the New Testament and the resurrection was three weeks ago. What is the result? What's the impact? What are the implications? Three weeks out, Jesus is alive, the tomb is empty, so many things are coming from black and white into living color. So many of the Old Testament ideas are now coming to their full bloom when we begin to realize that Jesus is alive. So you have to put yourself there in the mind of one of those early disciples. It's been three weeks since he was raised from the grave. What does that mean for your life? What does that mean for your heart, your forgiveness? What does it mean for your eternity? What does it mean for your priorities? What does it mean for what's important to you? So, come back into real time, and here's the thing. It's been a long time now since the resurrection happened. Since then, a lot of time has passed, but its truth has not changed, not one bit. The truth that Jesus Christ is alive and that the tomb is empty has not changed one bit, even though it's now over 2,000 years ago. So whether you were a disciple who was in the pages of the New Testament, like a Matthew or a Peter or one of those people, or you're a disciple who's living today, even though the time has passed, the truth of the resurrection and the implications and realities of the resurrection are unchanged. Frederick Buechner wrote this about the resurrection. He said, for the apostle Paul, the resurrection was no metaphor. It was the power of God. <clears throat> and when he spoke of Jesus as raised from the dead, he meant Jesus alive and at large in the world, not as some shimmering ideal of human goodness or the achieving power of hopeful thought, but as the very power of life itself. So... All of this stuff, this series surrounding the implications of the resurrection of Jesus, the hope is that they draw us deeper into our faith life with God. But living a life of faith in a culture of control is hard to do. We live in a culture of control. All the messages are, make the right plans, you can control your life. Set yourself up properly and you can write your script. My guess is that many of us, the older you get, the more you realize there's a whole bunch that I don't control. I might have thought I did, but I now can see that there's a whole bunch that I can't control. So we have to live with the tension, right? Well, what should I try to control? Where should I plan? The Bible calls us to a life of trusting God with so much and that's a countercultural way to live. So if we're going to live this life of trusting God in a culture of control, we should expect to experience a lot of the torque of those two elements being in play at the same time. Okay, so I think you get it. We're using the whole phrase of the title of this sermon series, If Then. If the resurrection is true, then what are the implications? What does this mean in our lives? If is a really interesting word because we use the word if and sometimes we mean since. The word if, if we use it in the traditional way, means if is on the possibility that something could be true. If it happens. If maybe this happens then if on the possibility that it could be true, right? But we also use the word if when we mean since, that it's on the actuality of its truth. And this use of the word is really the secret code to this whole series. Because when we say, if Jesus has been resurrected, then these are the implications, we mean since Jesus has been resurrected. Let me give you an example. 
Okay, so let's say it's on the late-ish part of an afternoon, and I get a text from my wife, Elizabeth, and she says, I'm going to stop at the grocery store on my way home. Can you think of anything that we need? So I text her back, and I say, if you're going to stop at the grocery store on the way home, we need some Briar's Mint Chocolate Chip ice cream. Right? Some of you know. That's not a want. That's a need. Some of you know that. OK. But notice, she says, I'm going to stop at the grocery store on my way home. Can you think of anything we need? And I say, if you're going to stop at the store, can you get some ice cream? I used the word if, but it meant since. I said, if you're going to stop at the store, but she's going to stop at the store. But I used the word if. I could have just as well wrote, since you're going to stop at the store, can you get some ice cream? The traditional use of the word if is on the possibility. But there's also another use of the word if, and it's since, on the actuality. And that's what we're talking about behind this whole series. OK, so context matters. When you read the Bible, knowing what's going on in that context matters a lot. So we're going to read a section from 2 Corinthians 8 in just a moment. But you need to know the context. Some of you may know this, or maybe it's new to others. The Apostle Paul wrote a bunch of letters or epistles to the churches. And there is a sub-theme in many of the letters that has to do with giving or taking up a collection. So you may know that the Apostle Paul was a Jewish guy, a rabbi in training, who then was converted to embracing Jesus as Lord and Savior. By the time a decade or two had unfolded in Jerusalem after the resurrection, the believers in Jerusalem were experiencing increased persecution and pressure from the Romans and the Roman occupation. So much so that those believers were experiencing the confiscation of property and a bunch of other pressures because they were holding that Jesus is Lord of their lives. And of course, the Roman Empire is saying, no, Caesar's Lord of your life. And they'd say, well, no, Jesus is Lord of our life. So that conflict got them the confiscation of property, money, and a bunch of other material difficulties. So the Apostle Paul's vision of this was, hey, you churches, all of you out there like Philippi, Ephesus, Thessalonica, and all these other places, since you have come to know the richness of life in Jesus, and it came to you originally from Jerusalem, from the believers in Jerusalem, where Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection and the ignition of the church happened. Since all this spiritual blessing came to you from Jerusalem, I'm inviting you now to help the believers in Jerusalem by helping them with their material needs. It's in a way a beautiful kind of little formula. He's like, look, they've brought you spiritual life and vitality so you help them now because their physical needs are being challenged. That's the context. Second Corinthians 8, he says, And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Just take a moment and read that sentence again. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. Like they're like, please let us give to this. Please let us give. Don't forget to ask us. Don't forget to include us. Please let us be a part of this. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. 
Okay, though he was rich, he gave it up, and for our sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And here's my judgment about what's best for you in this matter. Last year you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I've occasionally heard people around Richmond, people who have led ministries and other initiatives, I'll get a thank you note periodically and they'll say, I just want to thank Hope Church for their generosity to us. And people will tell me over time that Hope has a reputation of being a generous church. And I'm like, what an awesomely beautiful thing that a church can have a reputation for being generous. When it comes to these questions of generosity, and then we get down to these core questions of money and how we feel about money. Can we just admit that we all struggle with this in different ways? Like, let's just agree to that. Can we just admit that we all struggle with this in various ways? If I'm successful today, like if today's a good day at work, I occasionally feel this when I get up to speak. If I'm successful, you're going to go home frustrated and conflicted, and that's going to be a good day for me. Because these matters get at questions in our hearts that don't leave us going home with smooth sailing. They leave us having to deal with the tangles of our hearts. So I have this picture like in my head of an old timey movie and like black and white and this thief comes up to someone and they say, your money or your life? Well, for many of us, there's no or. My money is my life. But once we begin to realize that the resurrection is real, there's an or. And these believers could see that so clearly. My money's not my life. My money's just my money. My life is in God and it's secure and heaven is my eternal home. So if someone said to one of these believers, your money or your life, they'd be like, you can have my money, take my money because it's not my life. Or if you want, you can take my life because my life isn't my money. My life is completely secure and heaven is my home. So because my money is not my life, you can have my money or my life. Frankly, you can have both. That's the way the New Testament people write. That's the way they saw this. But for many of us, again, let's be honest, because our sense of life and security is so wrapped up in money, we're like, what do you mean my money or my life? My money is my life. In the Psalms, it says, guard your heart, for it's the wellspring of life. But for many of us, the struggle is guard your money, because we believe life is sustained by it. All right, so I'm sure many of you have been to memorial services or funerals before, and I have had what I call the sacred privilege of being involved in a lot of memorial services with families as they're celebrating somebody. And here's the thing, when people speak at a memorial service, what they're talking about is the heart of the person who's died. They're talking about their heart. I mean, these are where the real stories are, where the real richness is, they're talking about their heart. If you think that your accomplishments in life and your money is the real deal, well then at your funeral, we should just talk about your accomplishments and your money. But friends, if all that's talked about at your funeral is your accomplishments and your money, we have missed the real place of living. The real place of living is about our hearts. Okay, so, let me just call to your attention, if you're an underliner, four quick places to underline. Verse four, pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing. Just underline that. Pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing. Verse seven, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. Verse nine, Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake became poor. And verse 12, if the willingness is there, the gift is, access, is acceptable. So, pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing. That's a heart matter. In other words, there's this word out there among the churches that the Jerusalem church needs help 
Can you help them financially? And what we're being told is these people said, please, please, let us be a part of this. Right? This is so remarkable because the way this normally works is when word is out there that people are being asked for money, they're like, don't come talking to me. Like, don't be asking me for my money. These people are saying, ask me for my money. Please don't let me not be a part of this. That's an incredible expression of heart. It's a heart that has come to know the richness of the gospel in deep and real ways. So this church is like, please ask us for money. If you're in and around the world of fundraising, that's really unusual. That a bunch of people would be saying, please call me, please ask me for money. But these people are doing it. Their hearts are different. Next is this little section that says, see that you excel in this grace of giving. This is a matter of skill. It's like saying, learn to excel in this. Learn to be excellent at it. Many of us have spent a lot of time in our lives trying to develop skills in a host of different things. It might be your professional skills, communication skills, sales skills, teaching skills, whatever it is. Many of us have spent a lot of time trying to improve skills in various ways. This is saying, become excellent at giving. Literally, do what you need to do to get really good at this. Wow. Next one, and this is the biggie. Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. This is the core reveal of what's happening at the center of the gospel. Jesus, who has all power and glory in heaven, comes into the world and lives a humble human life and gives his life to us that we might have the richness of the glory of God. So Jesus, though he was rich, for your sake he became poor. Okay, do you know what this is? This is voluntary wealth transfer. It's voluntary wealth transfer. Jesus, who is rich, voluntarily gave up that richness to come and live a very humble human life that we who are poor might become rich and have his richness. It's voluntary wealth transfer. I know when I use the term wealth transfer that some of you get like hives, but it's voluntary wealth transfer, and this is always the issue. There are a lot of ways that wealth gets transferred. Sometimes it happens by taxation. Sometimes it happens by confiscation. Sometimes it happens through estate planning. Sometimes it happens through generous giving. There are a lot of ways it happens. But when we're talking about the generosity here, we're talking about voluntary giving because it's all about the heart. If you've been manipulated, cajoled, pressed, pressured, cornered to give, that's not what we're talking about. And frankly, even if you were invited to give and you were completely free, if you gave out of obligation, that's not what we're talking about. This is about the heart that has been so saturated with the gospel that generosity is the normal overflow. So we begin to realize that generosity is this core character trait of God. What does it say in perhaps the most well-known verse in the New Testament? John 3, 16, for God so loved that he gave. I know you want the rest, but let's stop there for a minute. For God so loved that he gave. This is what God's love does. It gives. For God so loved that he gave his only son. The core element of the gospel is that love is the basis and giving is the normal action of it. In Proverbs 22, it says, the generous will themselves be blessed for they share their food with the poor. So if we are Christians, that means we are people who have experienced the heart of the gospel. And the heart of the gospel therefore becomes the heart of a Christian. You see like the connect the dots transitive connection here. If we are Christians, then the heart of the gospel becomes our hearts. It's like 2 Corinthians 8, 9, where we're told Jesus Christ, though he was rich, for our sake became poor. Said another way, an ungenerous Christian does not know the gospel. An ungenerous Christian, I don't say that finger wagging like bad person, Somehow, one way or another, 
the true nature of the gospel hasn't gotten its way in there in our heart. Because if the true nature of the gospel gets in there, generosity happens all by itself. It doesn't have to be manufactured. So if you're wrestling with this, and I wrestle with it, and you're thinking, gee whiz, I don't know that I'm really generous. I would start not by praying and asking God to help you become more generous. I would start by asking him to help you understand the gospel even more fully. Because the more the gospel is in us, the more generosity comes out of us. Okay, so now a couple of really big ideas emerge. And they have everything to do with our sense of what we deserve, what we think we deserve. Do you remember in Matthew chapter 20, Jesus is teaching, if you know the parable, it's the parable of the workers in the vineyard. It's one of my favorites because it's so electrifying. The story is about day laborers. And in that day, when you were a day laborer, you'd go into the town square early in the morning and people who needed to hire laborers for the day would come into the town square and then they would say, hey, I'll hire you to work for me X number of hours, X pay. Do you want the job or not? You could say no to it if you thought, you know what? I'm going to try my luck and wait around because I think a better offer may come. You could try that. Some days you might try it and a better offer doesn't come. Then you're like, shoot, I missed a good opportunity. But that's the way it would work. So early in the morning, a vineyard owner comes into the town square to hire a bunch of day laborers. And the way the story is rolled out, he says to them, I would like you to work for a full day and I'll pay you X. Would you like to do it? And the people that say yes say, off we go. Those people do know that they have a good day's work ahead of them. They're not going to live with the anxiety of unemployment. They're going to know, oh, this is great. I'm going to take this job because I know I'll be able to feed my family. I've got the provision. Okay? But as the story rolls out, the vineyard owner needs more laborers. So he goes back into the town square a couple hours later, and he hires more laborers. And later in the day, he needs even more. So he goes back and he hires more laborers. Now, some things that are important in the story is... Generally speaking, the people who are still there in the town square by like two or three in the afternoon, those are probably not the people you want to hire. Those people are not the Johnny on the spot, early bird gets the worm kind of people. Those people are like late bird crosses their fingers and sees if they can get some kind of a job. Those people maybe stumble into the town square, shall we say, really late, and they're looking for some employment. So the story is even more powerful if you know this, because... The vineyard owner goes back into the town square and he hires those late arrivers to come work in the vineyard. And the electricity starts flowing at the end of the day because the vineyard owner gathers all the people who have worked in there and he starts paying them. And he pays them all the same amount of money. And a riot breaks out. And why does a riot break out? Because some people are like, what are you doing? You can't pay this guy who worked an hour who, did you know he got to the town square at like 1 p.m. anyway? And you're going to pay that guy the same thing you're going to pay me? No way. And he says to him, wait, didn't I offer you a job and what I would pay you? And I am fulfilling what I offered you. Yes, but. Yes, but. But what? And here's the punchline. Matthew 20. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or, ready for it, are you envious because I'm generous? No, I'm not envious because you're generous. I'm ticked off because you're paying somebody who worked an hour the same that I'm getting paid. Which equals you're envious because I'm generous. You're really frustrated because you would never do this. You would never do this because your heart is so different than mine. And you know in the parable, the vineyard owner is the God figure. So when Jesus raises the question of the vineyard owner saying, are you envious because I'm generous? He's saying God is generous. It's his heart. Okay, now where's the crucible in the story? It has everything to do with who you are, which one of those laborers you are, and what you think you deserve. And friends, here is the core element for so much of our life with God what you think you deserve. You either see yourself as somebody who deserved nothing and got this lavish expression of God's love and grace in your life, and the result is generosity and gratitude everywhere, or you're a person who thinks you deserve a lot better, you deserve a lot more, and if so, your heart is tied up in knots. And this whole Christian religion thing 
is just a dirge of requirements and obligations with a heart that's tied up in knots. We're told about two women in the Bible, one of whom puts in two copper coins in the offering at the temple in Jerusalem, and another one who breaks a jar, an alabaster jar of perfume on Jesus. We get more pictures about people's hearts when we see these stories. The first one is Jesus and the disciples are in the temple courts and they're watching people put money in the offering. And a bunch of rich people are saying, we're putting in, let's say, $100 bills. And then this poor woman comes in and she puts in two copper coins, we're told, effectively two pennies. It gets Jesus' attention. He calls the disciples over. He's like, hey, guys, look, look, look. She put in more than they did. No, she didn't. They put in like $100 bills. She put in two cents. No, no, she put in more than they did. How could that be possible? Here's how it's possible. Because the only thing you can give God is heart. You cannot give God money. We talk about this a lot, right? The Bible says it over and over again. God owns it all. So you can't give somebody something that they already own. All you can actually give God is your heart. The only currency that is persuasive in God's economy is the currency of our hearts. Jesus is not impressed with the amounts of money that the wealthy people are putting in there. Let me say this a little more provocatively. God is not impressed with how much money you have. And God is not impressed with how much money you give. The only thing that gets his attention is heart. And so for some person, you put 10 bucks in an offering and it's a sacrificial deal. And I think God is saying that person put in way more than the person who just wrote the $10,000 check. You see, here's the tension. Here's the way these stories start revealing our hearts and cause us sometimes to struggle. You see, the question is, what is it that you think you deserve? The point of Jesus telling the story about the day laborers is that every one of us would begin to realize we are all 11th hour hires who get the full benefits of the kingdom. And if all of us see ourselves that way and we have this grasp of the gospel, the natural result of this incredible gratitude, God, I'm just so thankful to you. And the natural result of that gratitude is generosity. So a person who's grateful, they just keep thinking, all that God's given me, all that God's given me. The person who's ungrateful is just thinking, all that I deserve from God that he's not giving me. All that I deserve from God that he's not giving me. To use the big Bible words, the grateful heart is a grace-based heart. I've been given so much that I don't deserve. The hard heart is a law-based heart. I deserve so much more than this from God. The gospel is an explosion of God's grace. And if we have come to understand it, our hearts will come alive with this explosion of grace and the result will be generosity. So then there's also this woman who breaks the alabaster jar of perfume on Jesus. You may know the story. And some of the disciples get all practical with them. They say, look, this is worth a ton of money. And we could have sold it and given money to the poor. I can't help but think that alabaster jar that has this incredible value of perfume in it, I can't help but think that the metaphor is that's our heart. Do we have these stone hearts? All the value is inside of them if we could just crack them open. And so, men, I take note, there are no stories I know of in the New Testament that elevate generosity that are about men. They're only about women. I'm serious. I take note of that. So these two women are lifted up and they give this incredible example of these generous overflowing hearts. You see, we're all 11th hour laborers who got all the gifts of God's love when we didn't deserve it. So in Hebrews chapter 10, remember I was telling you about the believers in Jerusalem. This is a bit of a description of them, but it's very revealing. It says, remember those earlier days after you'd received the light when you endured in a great conflict full of suffering? Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. These are those believers in Jerusalem that we're talking about who were in a very difficult time. Look what it says. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. 
Okay, this is an extreme example. Hopefully this isn't going to happen to us, but nonetheless, it's an example. And it says, you joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property. Like, come on. You joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property. How could that be possible? Because I realize now that Jesus is alive that my property is not a big deal. It's a temporary moving through my life here, and it's easy to let go of it because Jesus is alive, my hope is in heaven, and this life is just a short moving through stay. Because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. Okay, so now we're going to get one step deeper into the pantry. How do you see yourself when you think of money? I mean, we all wonder about these kind of questions. And the answer, the only way to try to figure it out is compared to whom? How do you see yourself when it comes to money? Well, you compare yourself to a bunch of other people. Well, who you compare yourself in, in its own right is going to have a lot to reveal about your heart. Ready? If your heart is a grace-based heart, you're probably going to compare yourself to people that are poorer than you. And you're going to realize, I have so much. Compared to all these people who have so much less, I have so much. If your heart is wrapped up in hard places of the law, you're probably going to compare yourself to people who are richer than you. And you're going to say, I deserve better. I should be able to have more like them. Okay, so years ago, I was praying about these matters. And I was talking to God about this. And what came to mind when I was praying was how Jesus called the disciples. And when he called the disciples, he called them to be fishers of men. And you know, those people fish, they fish with nets. He called them to be fishers of men. And I was praying and talking to God about some of these matters of money and all that kind of jazz. And I was thinking about net worth. And as I was praying, this very clear thought came to my mind. David, the question is not, what's your net worth? The question, if you're going to be a fisher of men, is what's your net worth? What's your net worth? If this gospel is this lavish offer of love and adoption and forgiveness and eternal life from God, and our calling as disciples is to be fishers of men and women, fishing to help people experience this, the question is not so much, what's your net worth? The question is, what's your net worth? A couple of world statistics real fast. If your net worth is more than $69,000, you're in the top 10% of the wealthiest people in the world. I know what you're saying. Yeah, well, if you compare me to everybody in the world, okay? If your net worth is more than $3,200, you're wealthier than half the world's population. So you might be saying, well, why are you comparing yourself to all of the world's population? And the reason I do that is because all of us are humans, and I'm a human, and I live a human life. And every one of those other people, regardless of where they live, they're a human, and they live a human life. So I'm not comparing myself to the wealthiest strata of the wealthy zip codes in the Richmond metro area. I compare myself to the whole world. And when I do, I'm really wealthy, and I bet you are too. So Elizabeth O'Connor says, none of us has to be an accountant to know what 10% of a gross income is, but each of us has to be a person on his knees before God if we are to understand our commitment to proportionate giving. Proportionate to what? Proportionate to the accumulated wealth of one's family, proportionate to one's income and the demands on it, which vary from family to family, proportionate to one's sense of security and the degree of anxiety with which one lives, proportionate to the keenness of our awareness of those who suffer, proportionate to our sense of justice and of God's ownership of all wealth, proportionate to our sense of stewardship for those who follow after us, and so on and so forth. The answer, of course, is in proportion to all of these things. You see, because this is heart work. In other words, your heart is your part. What happens is God's work. So in the Bible, this generosity is not about Puritan practicality, but it's about gospel generosity. What do I mean by Puritan practicality? You have an opportunity to give, and you go through all kinds of calculations. Well, what if they don't do that? What if this? What if that? Puritan practicality is the disciples, when they see this lavish overflow of love with the woman who breaks the alabaster jar of perfume in her extreme devotion to Jesus, they say, oh, you shouldn't have done that. You should have sold that. You could have given the money to the poor. Does that raise tension in you? It does in me. I think that's the point of the story. The tension it raises gets our attention. Because what Jesus says is, one of the most disturbing phrases in the entire Bible, the poor you will have with you always. 
There's some tension. Should you help the poor? Absolutely. The Bible says it all over the place, help the poor. But poverty is not going to go away. That's a tension point. If poverty was going to go away, I feel like it would have been gone by now. Jesus says, the poor you will have with you always. Should you help the poor? Absolutely. And yet this lavish outpouring of this huge value of money, they're just like, this is a waste. So for instance, let's say somebody said, I would like to give half a million dollars to Hope Church, and I would like the church to build a sculpture of Jesus out front. Do you know how much consternation that would cause? Put that donation money to work and put a sculpture of Jesus out there. People would say, how much did that cost? Half a million bucks. We used half a million bucks to put a sculpture of Jesus out front. Do you know what could have been done with half a million bucks? Exact same kind of thing. Jesus is elevating this heart of incredible devotion to him. You see, what it reveals is that money isn't an idol. Money just reveals our idols by what we do with it. So what if we want clarity? Malachi 3.10 speaks about tithing, and there's a whole bunch of places, giving 10% of our money to God. Malachi 3.10, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there'll be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I'll not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. This is one of the very, very few places in the Bible where God says, you test me in it. Go ahead, test me. Test me in this. You give 10%. Just test me and see if the floodgates of heaven and blessing don't pour out in your life. Test me, he says. So in closing, maybe some practical application because the apostle Paul says, see that you become excellent at the grace of giving. How do we become excellent at the grace of giving? The most helpful is the five P's of giving. This comes from Andy Stanley at North Point Church. The five P's are plan, plan, Make a plan for your giving. It won't happen if we don't make a plan. Secondly, set a percentage. Yes, 10% is the goal, but let's not play games. Hardly anybody's giving 10%. So set a percentage that is a goal. And then prioritize the giving. If we make our giving the result of our leftovers, what do we have when everything else is gone? We're not going to have any leftovers to give from our leftovers. Prioritize your giving. Make it the money that goes out first when you get paid. Set up your bill pay, set up an EFT, whatever it is. Prioritize it. Be purposeful. Really give prayerful thought to where this money is going. I would say for the cause of the gospel. And then set a progression goal. Try to increase your percentage year by year by a percent. And you can make that kind of progress as you go. Because ultimately the question for a Christian is not, am I raising my standard of living, but am I raising my standard of giving? That's the question that this generous and overflowing heart is going to ask. Because this is the way that we live like God lives, with joy and the ability to bless other people. And it's one of the most significant ways to live a beautiful life. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today and we bring our hearts to you. Lord, our hearts have all kinds of knots tied up in them. We've got all kinds of calcified places, all kinds of places where that stone jar looks like a stone heart. And Lord, would you help us come to know the gospel so much more deeply that our hearts just get broken open with this love? And would you help us come to know you so deeply and beautifully in this gospel that your joy becomes our joy? We pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and join us for a final song of worship?
So that woman who asked me for money that I mentioned in the video, for some strange reason, strange reason, I remember her name, it was Carolyn. I think about her periodically, I've prayed for her. I wonder if she's still alive. After the first service, a friend of mine said, David, given the impact she had on your life, maybe it was she who was the angel. I've never forgotten that moment. So as we go today, as you go into your week, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. And may you overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit who's at work in your life. And in every situation and every circumstance, the ones that are happy and the ones that are hard, the Holy Spirit is whispering to you, come closer to your Father in heaven. He loves you beyond your wildest dreams. Amen, everybody. Great to see you. I hope you have a great week.